transactions are created in the marketplace. It's when someone is giving something for value, right? So just Mm -hmm. because you're passionate about something doesn't mean that what you're passionate about is valuable in society. What's happening? Trying to juggle what we call the 10 things at once. What's up with you? Same, 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 same. I am, uh, <laughs> I don't even know yeah. where to start. Yeah, I've had an interesting 24 hours. I'm in the middle of a sprint. Uh, essentially, I hired and fired someone in 12 hours and then hired you someone else who I, sh- who I should have hired. And I'm excited because the guy is really good um, and he's excited to join for the long term. And it's more because he likes the energy and he, you know, it's just a really good fit culturally. And then um, I made an offer to buy a tech company and mm-hmm. the dude tried to shop my price around and raise it by 40 percent. And I was like, yeah, he didn't even come back and ask me. You know, you know what I mean? Like he just like he tried to stall me out and then try to like create a bidding war. And I was like not having that. So I took my offer off the table. And two hours later, he <laughs> sent to me an email saying, Hey, I, I told him like, hey man, it looks like you're parent, you're obviously shopping my price around because you raised your price by 40%. And so I'm just going to rescind my offer. And um he sent me an email t- uh saying, um, asking if I could re- redo the offer. He's ready to like execute for it. And so I'm, I'm just been sitting all day thinking about it <laughs> because. Um, okay. So did he get anybody else involved when he changed the pricing? Um, did he say that there was another, a firm other offer on the table? And there was de- um, he never said anything about the offer. No, okay. no, he just said it at the same price. He said, can you just resend the same offer? No, so but he was stalling. Previous, previously. Why? He was stalling. I want to know he what was- to stall out for. He was saying, I'm going to review the document, but then I seen him change the price from the list price and he raised it by 40%. Like as soon as I made change my it offer, where? He, raised, he changed it on the site, the marketplace. Oh, okay. Like, as soon as I did the offer, he five minutes later changed the price and said, I'm going to review this and get back to you in a couple hours. I waited all day to the end of the day. And, um, I woke up and I was like, I stood, he stood in the second my offer. It was like 24 hours. So I just took it off the table. Cause I knew at that point he was definitely shopping me because he didn't communicate. Yep. There we go. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. You took the yeah. offer off the table because you didn't get any communication. Yeah. And, and I wasn't going to um, chase him. I would respond to him with an offer that's at least 20% less. I was thinking the same thing. Nope. So here's I was going to go do. savage. Here's what you do know. No, you don't. You're going to teach this kid a lesson in manners, not business. Okay. You're going to send him, um, you know, while I I totally understand that you're now ready to execute, um, timelines and communication are very important in business and really important to me when it comes to who I do and do not do business with, who I do and do not get into relationship with. Um, And I didn't get a response from you. And this is this is not the this is not the only company that I'm moving on buying. So, unfortunately, what I have to offer, like I I'm happy to I'm happy to submit an offer to you now. You have one hour to review it and get back to me, or I'm gonna, again going to take it off the table and submit them a twenty percent less offer. Keep your calendar open for the hour following sending it and see what happens. I'll take it. You're going to teach them a lesson in manners. Yeah, I like that. I didn't. Think I am the, the most time inconsistent element. communicator in the pl- on the planet, with with a lot of people in my life, a lot. When it comes to money and business, not a chance. Yeah, I don't play with the communication game, like at well, all. Um, their inconsistency in communication happens because <laughs> one of two things: people are either you'll see your like your exceptional creatives will be what we call fly by night. They'll get started doing something. They'll be texting you, texting you. And then all of a sudden they'll stop responding in the middle of a conversation. It's because they started doing something. Some people Mm. can't do and talk at the same time. Like I can't walk and chew gum to save my fucking life. Not kidding you. Literally cannot (laughs) walk and chew gum. I would fall on my face. 
but it's just because of how my brain's wired. Mm -hmm. So if there's a timeline on something, a good creative will have created themselves the system to not fuck up, fuck everybody over. Because the truth is, is that thing that I, that bright, shiny squirrel that won't ever change. Never. Absolutely never. Especially with creatives, they will always act like that. They'll always be like that. It's not personal. It's not for disrespect. It's just how we're wired. So if a creative hasn't learned that lesson the hard way, at least once, usually more than once, and created a system, they fuck themselves over. Now, when it comes to shopping, if you're trying to sell a company, A, I know that you're buying under the five-figure range right now. And the truth is, is, if you really want, need, need or want to sell a company and you're selling it under five figures, you, your response system has to be 10 times better than it does when you're trying to gain a new client. Nobody needs less than, less than 10 grand that bad. I can pick up the phone, call my mother and get 10 grand if I really needed it. I mean, for Christ's mm-hmm. sake, like nobody needs less than 10 grand that bad. If you need some, less than 10 grand that bad, something else is going on. So if your communication isn't like spot on, I don't want to do business with you anyway. Now, as long as it's a straight acquisition, make the offer the way I just told you to, see what happens. If it doesn't feel like a straight acquisition or if he has any sort of fulfillment on the backside, make the rules and regulations way more stringent. Oh yeah, I'm doing DD for sure. I was going to get uh, Brian Ball. Actually, I have to take some back in like just a look underneath the hood because it's a... um it's uh ai copywriting and i want to repurpose it to do <laughs> sales scripting like i want to oh, do like oh does do you have do an it. ai do you have well do you have an ai programmer at your expense yeah she's on the phone with me that's so what i thought it was great i just want to bring it in house and just play with it okay because if you have somebody who knows how ai works and can also write the code to update a software continuously, buy it. If not, don't fucking touch it. You know that programmers, while they're a dime a dozen, are not that easy to come by. Good ones aren't. Mm-hmm. Like Brian can Brian can program anything, but he doesn't have a background in AI. Artificial mm-hmm. intelligence is a it's a touchy subject that most people don't truly understand. Because it's, it it's, a, cool. it's a matter of building a massive, massive databases is what it is. Not to mention anything that's run by AI is going to be a heavy motherfucking piece of anything. Heavy mm-hmm. as fuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just see yeah. this super clear, like, um, you know, there's a lot of like different softwares in the market that do like uh, blog creations and SEO and all that. Oh yeah. And um, I thought it would be great to create something for um, sales calls, like live feedback on sales calls, or even like have a plugin feature for emails of like, Hey, is this email persuasive enough? Or like that can analyze like an email chain and say, Hey, here's a great follow-up message based upon, you know, what we know about the customer. Right. Um, so I just thought it was possibly like a bunch of different, um, different avenues to play with. Um, okay. So without this being a mile long conversation, to live by a I haven't already looked into white labeling it i am probably going to ask you if you've been listening to me for the last two years yes i did <laughs> look into white labeling i did look into all these different things there is a okay. company that does some type of ai for like in sales like some I've type of something okay all that. fair yeah. enough um yeah. secondly you did all that um take a look under the hood depending on how it's written but the truth is don't pay more than five grand for it, period. Oh, absolutely not. No it's matter. I mean, though. I don't care. I don't care if it's gone to market and they have a list and a client and a customer base. Still don't pay more than five grand for it because the upkeep on it, your overhead on a piece of, on, on an intentional piece of software like that, the overhead upkeep on that is about somewhere between 21 and 26% just on the development side. So 21 to 26% of of gross profit will be upkeep alone. 
which I is mean, fine. You just have to make sure that the you have to make sure that the business model works. Yeah, um, because um, this isn't um, something you can just create and then put out there and leave. You have to update it constantly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like little, yeah. it's like little kids. They want diapers and food and snacks and love me and hold me and hug me and you know the thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. it me. is a yeah. lot of fun. Update me, update me. I mean, it, because if you don't update it, if you don't update it often, the truth is, is that it will it will work for a very very finite amount of time. Because the human condition changes way too often. And artificial intelligence, the stuff that they have out there, there's a reason why nobody's gone balls to the wall in that area. It's because the stuff that's out there is good Mm enough-ish. And to you and I, it sucks, but it's good enough-ish. Slash, nobody wants to babysit something forever. No one wants to commit to it. No, but I mean, I'm in the field for fuck's sake. I've got a doctorate in the field and and I wouldn't commit to it. It gets boring. Repetition projects get really boring. You have to find a yeah. developer that's really, really, really consistent. It yeah, really, I thought about, can hear you really clearly. I, th- I thought about using um, Y Combinator's uh, uh, co-founder match. Okay. Possible. I feel like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if I bring the asset and the sales experience and the resources to the table and all that person needs to do is put in sweat equity and the plan will be to grow it and then sell it like exit, like clear, like grow it to a million, a uh, a million in AAR as a SAS and sell it at a 10 X multiple. Okay. That will be my sort of be bought on that. If you're, if your human also brings in, um, uh, acquisition capital, a list. They don't have some sort of reach. They have sweat equity, but no reach. You could still be fucked. Yeah, because like the truth in is, terms is of that like, my reach sorry, isn't big. Question. Alexa, stop. My reach isn't big enough for that. And that's mm. saying something. To go to market on something like this, you'll put probably ten thousand more hours into it, at least fifteen to twenty k in hard cost and the sweat equity to match what you're putting in plus like they'll put in a lot of time, but they don't Mm -hmm. have human, any sort of human capital to match the reach. Mm -hmm. If you go live, I, the market's flooded with software does. It just Mm -hmm. is. And AI is it's human based. That's where everybody, like you could build a software that once it's done, it's done. That's where you shift your other founders into acquisition. But if one of your founders is a developer and all they're doing is updating, they're putting in their time and you're still having to do all of the finding, keeping customer service, ass kissing, hand holding, email answering nonsense. Mm -hmm. That kind of software can be an ugly game if they don't have human capital. So definitely look for human capital. Look for somebody who's already in marketing who has an itch for it, but isn't good at it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking. I'm, I hate, I hate pissing on your Cheerios. I'm sorry. Ugh, I mean, not I'm my not discouraged. The day to do. Okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not nowhere near discouraged at all. Um, if anything, like I'm not in a humongous rush to be like, I need to scale it absolutely right now. It's more of a, like, oh, all right, let's, it's at a good price. It is a I've piece of software the that out. has a it has a best buy date though. You can't acquire it's, it, it and a, let it sit. It's like milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you acquire um, it, even the concept and the structure, and let it sit. You're starting from scratch anyway. Mm-hmm. So keep that in I mind. Feel like it because, is bootstrap because it no, has I mean, if you, not bootstrap. I said if you acquire it. You acquire it, but you're not in a hurry to scale it and you let it sit. You are starting from scratch when you pick it back up. Human mm-hmm, condition mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm, it is mm-hmm. human. It's got a sell by date, a use by date. If you buy it, you need to be able to put a lot of energy into it right now. Yeah, I'm going to think about it today. I'll talk to, I'll talk to Kat. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm talking to, I'm talking to Kat. I'm going to talk to Brian too, but you know, I, yeah. I might, I'm still going to do what you say just to see if this guy bites. Still going to go through DD and oh. just kind of look underneath the hood. Oh, always. And then, um, 
And then I'm um, you, like when it's all shit and said and done, don't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I then I got to figure out a way. That blows up your fucking spot. Yeah. Makes me feel like a jerk. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I'll, that's, I guess, my update for the day for <laughs> sure. Sweet. Um, yeah. So that's the big thing for me. And I haven't bought any new NFTs or crypto today. So I'm like patting myself on the back. Wow. Stay patient. Wait till next year. That's Met with impressive. my account today. I was like, I need Good. to slow down. I probably should <laughs> probably make some uh, contributions to my Roth or lower my tax bill or not Roth, but my SEP. So um, yeah, that's it for me. I mean, what's up with you? What's what updates you got? Um, what updates do I have? Uh, I'm closing. I'm actually closing out an AI project right now. Um, doing some um, institutional and interaction updates for the dating websites, the dating apps. Mm-hmm. So we finished up this morning and a debrief with their team. It was really good. Um, let's see what else have I done today? Um, nothing of great consequence. It snowed yesterday, so I haven't left the house. It's freezing. Oh. I'm miserable. Oh, you know wow. me. Go play, go do some snow, go do some snow angels or something. You know what's so funny about what you just said? I had I had a talk with a client today who uh brought up this might be a future project, like in 2023, I'm guessing, because we have other things to do, but she wants to um bring her uh like she wants to pretty much create a pick and shovel for the dating industry. I'm not gonna tell her idea out here on, on, on the internet, but I think it's pretty interesting and I think you'll I think you'll you'll vibe with it, especially since she's like been in the game for like almost two decades. Really well respected, okay. knows her shit. And uh I think it might be a good fit for a project in 2023. So we'll we'll talk about that. But um Thanks. cool. So so um today's just gonna be me, you, Heather. Josh is in the air, is I think he's on a plane right now in Chicago. I love it. Um, so the audience get to get us, which is great, which is why we have three people and, and invite guests. Every episode is gonna be different and fresh. And so thank you guys for joining. And uh I guess the thing that I want to hop into first right now, based upon that we talked about uh, on the last episode that really you know stuck with me. Um, the first thing was passion and purpose doesn't equal profit. And so <laughs> I'm super interested to kind of hear a little bit more. I want you to unpack that a little bit what, what you mean by you know passion and purpose doesn't equal profit. So I'm gonna be devil's advocate today and I'm gonna ask you why? Does, why did that grab your attention so easily? What was it about what I said that grabbed your attention? And why have you been pondering it? You know, um, because, you know, it's such against the grain of what you hear in society, like in terms of, oh, you could be anything when you grow up, focus on your passion. What are you passionate about? And I think what it really resonated with me is because <laughs> knowing how transactions are created in the marketplace it's when someone is giving something for value right so just Mm -hmm. because you're passionate about something doesn't mean that what you're passionate about is valuable in society right and then obviously i mean to me you know it doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean it's valuable Mm -hmm. to to the person you're standing in front of Yes. Every like, everything just, yeah. everything that is everyone is valuable to someone. And you have to know who that someone is. Mm-hmm. You definitely have to know who that someone is. And then my other take was with the purpose part was just because you like are in alignment and like you're you're and you're like do, you're busy doesn't mean you're making progress. Right? Nope. So like that's <laughs> so like yeah, that's that's my take on it because it's easy to be. Bu- I even count myself like I have to like give myself a briefing every day and like explain and enroll myself into like why is this task important for the business or important for the client. Like, like if it's not important, then it's in my like I don't deal with it right because it's so easy to you know get to the busy work. So you know, what's your take on this? Right, this 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 is my thought process. I don't I think that passion is is great. Um, but I also believe that passion, you know, doesn't mean you're providing value to society, right? Like, I think it's Agreed. easy to, uh, I think it's easy to not, it's not an all catch all, right? So that's my, that's no. my take on the subject. All right. So, 
Um, passion and purpose doesn't equal profit is, I mean, it is, it's a cornerstone. It's a keynote that I give. Um, and it's a cornerstone. It started, who was it? I really want to say it was Gary Vee. I think I'm almost positive it was. Um, but I had seen him speak for a corporate, a private corporate conference. And the message was, um, you know, you we were born into a society where people say, like, you can be anything. You can be anything you want to be. Not true. Bullshit. I cannot be a fighter pilot. And I learned really young that that was not the case. I was born with a genetic eye disease that says fighting fighter pilot is not in my game plan. Now, does it mean that I wasn't in the military? No. Does it mean that I didn't work with like really closely with the air team? No, but I couldn't fly the plane. So don't think I'm tall enough to be a basketball player, or big enough to be a football player. So <laughs> you can't be anything you want to be. Like everybody's like, oh, just do what you love. Like, no, I absolutely don't think that that's possible. I also don't think that it's rational. It is, it is a lackluster lack of rational thought that puts people in what we call the downward emotional spiral. And the outcome to it, always, it's always painful. It always hurts. Because then people have their hearts broken over, oh, like, my mommy told me I could be like that. I mean, honestly, like Tom Bilio and Simon Sinek talked about this, the participation trophies. Good Lord, what did we do to our children when we started giving them fucking participation trophies? You lost. Meet. Learn to live with it. Because we, we, we taught an entire an entire sector of the population that losing was something that you could avoid failing was something that you should avoid instead of like, Hey, like better luck next time, pick it up, dust it off. Like put your big girl pants on because failure is when I was young, failure just wasn't a big deal. It's like, Oh, that didn't work. Okay. What are you going to do about it? It was always what's next. So the idea that like, oh, you can go be who you want to be or like follow your passions. I have a really good friend who is super passionate about watching, binge watching Netflix and like like hanging out and playing with her kids. That is, there is no ROI in that. Is it emotional? Sure. She loves, she loves being a stay at home mom, but she was like, I'm passionate about hanging out with my kids. I'm like, okay, um, no. That's not an option. You need an effective option. She was like, okay. I was like, if you're passionate about hanging out with your kids, do you want to teach other moms to like be better moms? Like, like find find something you want to do if you want to do something or just don't do anything. That's the truth. But passion and living your purpose, like I am a firm, I stand firmly behind personal and professional development and positivity as a go-to and Reality has to be somewhere in this game. It just does. So when you're looking at like, what am I doing? Like your passion and your purpose, it's not that that doesn't equal profit. Sometimes it does. Yesterday we talked about um, athletes being for like being forcible entrepreneurs. Athletes have it. They have a special unique set of circumstances. Most of them are sincerely passionate about the game. There are very few who are talented that aren't passionate about it. It just doesn't happen. But like they're passionate about the game and that's what they get to do for a living. That's luck. But it's not real. It's not realistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think two things there that I want to just hop on that I it's kind of I love yeah. how you know the the the, the alignment. Um, failure, oh man, that's one of my favorite things to talk about because when I first graduated out of college and I decided not to be a chemical engineer and to go into business and, and sales and take a humongous pay cut to bet on myself, my first, one of my first managers at the time, my first day at the job, right. I'm by myself in the city, right. Don't have any <laughs> friends. Don't know anyone. I'm the only black guy in the office, even though it doesn't matter in 21st century, but is the person who's the black guy, only black guy in the office. Right. And the youngest guy in the office, obviously you stick out. Right. And um, 
my manager told me, I'll never forget this. Literally, I give him a shout out for this pretty often. He was like, Desmond, if you don't make any mistakes, I know you're not trying. Mm-hmm. Precisely. Oh, and manager. that like, that, that like put me in the perspective of one, not to be afraid to failure, but also like push my limits and really just like, you know, not be attached to failing. And that really helped propel me even to this day. Right. Um, so big time on that. Um, number two that I love how you, what you said was, um, you mentioned, um, how most people who are really good at what they do, like, it's very rare to also be super like passionate, you know, like to be really like in alignment with that. I mean, like not saying like, you know, some people are in absolute alignment, like making a bunch of money, like doing what they love every day. And I think that, I think that's great. Uh, but now, you can find- I'm going to interject and pause. Like don't, don't mistake loving what you do. They are two different things. <laughs> Passion my like the thing that makes me like giddy and goosebumpy and excited has absolutely nothing to do with what I do for a living, but I love what I do. Mm-hmm. I get up in the morning, like, yeah, this is awesome. Like nobody has it as good as me. But you can't, you cannot confuse passion and being passionate. Cause I'm passionate about what I'm up to in business, but my life's passion, the things I love to do, are not necessarily what makes me money. My purpose in life is not what makes me money. I mean, let's be real, right? Like in the entrepreneur game, you have days that are absolutely like just suck, (laughs) right? I feel like there's more days that suck than days that are like, yeah, right? But like the days that are, yeah, makes the days that suck. Like the contrast, like it's just, it's beautiful, Right. And like choosing, cause you talked about, you know, we talked about this last episode, like deciding to choose to do something, you know, that sucks is literally like when it comes down to simplicity, like the biggest difference for between people who are entrepreneurs and people who are not entrepreneurs, it's like deciding to do the things that you don't want to do, even though you might fail or not time and time and again, and, you know, staying in the game, being persistent, right. And having that, having that mm-hmm. factor. Um, but hey, look, um, I think this moves into a really the next segment um, that I really want to unpack um, that I think is I think is very interesting that's going on right now here in America, which is um, the a tale of two different narratives, right? So in the job market Say specifically, slower a tale of two different what? Two different narratives in the job narratives. Market. Yeah, narratives, narratives. Yep, yep. Um, so. I, I, we're just want to bring this up because I'm actively planning on expanding my, you know, spending the company um, throughout all of 2022. And so hiring the right people. And I know, you know, in the last episode, we mentioned a growth plan, which we'll still plan out in the future mm-hmm. to do for the audience, kind of go through a growth plan. But um, hiring the right people are super important, not just like culturally, ah. but like skill wise, aligning incentive. Yep. And um, I think the psychology behind these two different tales are just like so interesting, right? Like on one hand, oh, yeah. we're talking about like the unemployment rate, open jobs. On the other hand, you're hearing about this called great resonation, right? Where like 3% mm-hmm. of Americans, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, are resigning and <laughs> there's still 10.5 million open jobs at the end of Q3, right? So I'm interested to kind of hear your take of um, these two different tales. And then also I'm interested to hear about your case about like, would you hire a person who is desperate for a job versus someone who doesn't need the job? Like who you want more? I think that'd be kind of Ooh. interesting to hear. Yeah. Neither for the answer to that. And I will unpack why later. But when it comes to the two different narratives, like one of the big, one of the big, I almost want to say explosions that COVID caused was a shift in the job market. Like our unemployment rates were down. Um, finding employees wasn't hard. Everybody was in the grind. COVID happened. Nobody could go to work. And a lot of companies made what I would say would be the worst decision ever and laid off their, their employees. And it's a, a lot of the companies that are seeing the biggest like pain and the struggle now are your 
labor type, like your labor employment, like your manufacturing and your distribution and your truck drivers. And, and there's a, there's a fine line between that profit break and keeping the people, you know, you need to survive. And a lot of, I, in my opinion, a lot of companies made a big mistake in doing it. They just flat out screwed up. It was the worst choice they could have made. So now we're sitting here, a bunch of people got laid off. They collected unemployment for a while. And here we are. And they're like, well, I wasn't happy in my job anyway. But that, well, that led into the bigger question of what do I really want? What do I want to be doing? And for the people who are doing jobs that made them flat out miserable, they didn't go back to them. And it doesn't matter how badly they made the money. They didn't go back to them. They didn't go back to them because they weren't happy. They looked for something else. They invested in another skill set. They changed the narrative. And that's, I mean, that's what we're seeing all over the place. The job market is doing the same thing that the real estate market did in 2008. Flipping. And people are not flipping with it. Yeah. I think we're in this like creator, freelance, like you know, chill arbitrage, like everyone, like, you know, work remote, like people are like getting hip to work remote and realizing why, like when the whole world could be your client, I mean, it opens up so many different possibilities. Um, and if you could be anywhere and still, you know, serve any, anyone, anywhere, then like you're seeing this great migration to these smaller towns, you know, away from the big cities, mm -hmm. even myself, look at me, I'm sitting in Columbia right now because I'm like, why am I paying five grand a month in San Diego when I'm never home? Like, why not like go to explore for a year or two and <laughs> keep more of the money I make and reinvest it in the right. business, reinvest it in myself, right? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah. you're just, we, we're seeing a shift and like, <sighs> I touched on this yesterday, but one of my my longtime mentors and lifelong friends, Randy Pennington, started talking about, and he coaches and puts together together like corporate teams and does buyouts and stuff like that or mergers. So he works a lot with like big manufacturing companies, big um, like C level teams, and getting them to work smarter and not harder. And everybody keeps coming to him like, I can't. I, why can't I get? Why can't I find him place? Why can't I keep him place? He's like, why? are you losing them in the first place? He's like, solve the right problem. Don't answer the question in front of you. Solve the right problem. Because if you can't solve, why are you losing them in the first place? Then you can't solve how to get them if you don't know why they're leaving. And so it was, it, there's a giant pullback in this going, okay, well, what makes somebody look? And we touched on this yesterday. It's like, you know, well, what makes somebody look is a lot of different things. You have a very small niche in the world that looks because they're just flat out curious, never going to change. And then you have people who look because their job isn't fulfilling what they need financially, or it is, or their company is not fulfilling what they need emotionally, not being recognized, not being seen, not being heard, not being taken seriously. These are all small and minute things that make a huge difference in whether or not somebody wants to come to work every day. Here's a big one. And also walking on eggshells. Do this person have my back? Right. Like it, I, a lot I of mean, people I speak yeah. with that are still in corporate, like they feel like, yes, they're receiving this paycheck, but like there's a bunch of friction usually between some type of middle management. Right. Well, like and that friction like, has always been there. Yeah. And then add on top of that, the fact that quite a few of them, like, what is it? Like 40, 41% of um, employees that they opted to go back to their previous company that were, that were let go, had to re-interview. They had, I mean, it was like, no one recognized my the work that I've been doing has ever been recognized. Like my contribution is being recognized. Do you even care about who I am? What's going on in my life? My family, my, is my well being of any consequence to you? Mm -hmm. And when most people ask that question, the answer is no. Your well being mm -hmm. is of no consequence to them. Your well being is of no consequence to anybody but you. Mm -hmm. And so you get to that, like, 
what I call that like spike in the middle. It's like, well, if you don't care how I'm feeling, then I don't care whether or not I give you two weeks or I'm going to find somebody who does care. I'm going to find somebody who does take my voice seriously, take my ideas seriously. Somebody who does want to let me be um, collaborative and do meaningful work. I mean, in, in the smallest, smallest spaces, better ways to run shifts in a canning factory. It was actually a case study last month. So, so let's go back to that one question I asked you because, you know, I have an interesting take on this, but I'm, I'm pretty interested to hear your take on why you said neither, you wouldn't hire neither a desperate person or someone who doesn't need the job. It's a non-factor in hiring somebody. It's a non-factor? Yep. Neither. Neither matters. You could be mm. desperate as fuck for work or you could be, I could have sought you out and neither would matter if the skill set doesn't match. Mm-hmm. and the commitment isn't there, it doesn't matter. But first and mm-hmm. foremost, if the skill set doesn't match, I don't hire ever. Yeah, I, will, I mean, that's... I will slow down mm-hmm. or do the work myself before I will hire for something where I know it's not a fit. Now, a lot of people don't have that luxury. If you're running a, a daycare and your girl that runs the daycare during the day, like so that you're not working 24 hours a day quits and you have to hire somebody. Yeah. For the, for an average entry level position, do you want to hire somebody who's hungry or do you want to hire somebody who's not? It depends. It depends if their skill sets are matched. If, if they match down the board and you've got somebody who's desperate for a job and you have somebody who isn't desperate for a job, I would ask a series of questions, a series of growth questions to see who would be more likely to stick around, who would be more likely to contribute to a a bigger picture. But there's not always an answer as to who to hire. It's not that simple. Yeah, I get it. I get, I guess I was talking about more in a perfect scenario. Like this person has all the skills, the experience, Obviously, they want like I won't say they don't want to work for you, but they they obviously are qualified, right? Let's just say that they're qualified. And I was mm-hmm. thinking more of like the psychological profile because I don't know. I have a very interesting take. My interesting take, which I guess I'm playing devil's advocate here, is Go for it. Um, to me, desperate people are like not in not within the like the culture that I will personally want to build, only because you know, their come from is totally like, it's not alignment with me. Right. So like, for instance, they might lie and say that they're capable of doing something that they're obviously not competent of. Right. So like, I think it leaves more like tilt to do, you know what I mean? To be out of integrity one. Cause I think hmm. there's a huge difference between someone who's hungry and someone who's desperate. Right. When people yep. are desperate, they do wild stuff. I'm talking about like, you know, they'll do kill, steal, you know, whatever they have to do in order to to self-preserve because as human beings, we all want to be in self-preservation. And I think in interviews, you know, you can feel that energy too. Like, wow, I want to be like, you know, like, you you know what I'm saying? Like this guy's living in clear scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. Like where someone who's hungry might be living abundance. Like I'm about to make this bread. I'm about to create this impact. I'm just like, oh man, I'm just like, I can see a clear picture. Like, that energy is totally different than like living in scarcity. Like, well, you know what I mean? Like you're more, way more likely statistically to do things unethically, right? Because you're desperate, right? Um, and then also I think the opposite end of it, like the person who doesn't need a job, like, you know, like, I don't know what, it's like the girl who like you want, you know, that, that like doesn't go out. The girl anymore, who doesn't right? need a boyfriend, the girl who yeah. doesn't need a date. For even, yeah. Or even the guy, right? Like I, I think psycho- like people want what they can't have. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that might tilt me as well. Like, you know, people who don't need the work, if they, ch- I know if they choose to do the work, that means that they are obviously like enrolled into something like they're, they're curious. Right. So I don't know if All I right. could choose. Let me, let, would, me yeah. let me inject a little bit of oh shit into your bubble. Okay. So <laughs> riddle me this a desperate person or somebody who is, who is in a greater need for a job is statistically 67% statistically more likely to 
show up on time, call out, out less, or put their personal um, their personal life ahead of the business's goals. Sixty seven percent less likely than mm-hmm. the other person. Now, your person that's not hungry or that's that's not like doesn't need the job, you're also seventy five percent more apt to try to make somebody like that happy than you are just giving somebody a job. So like people pleasing, like having Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you're looking at two sides of the spectrum. Do you want to know what I would do if I was an employee that needed or an employer that needed to fill a spot and had those two candidates with matching skill sets? Hire both. Nope. Prove it. Show me. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, this is an interesting I them, take, I would right? give them both a really a short, I mean, it depends on the industry, depends on the rules, depends on the laws. Get clear yeah. on that. Not yeah. cover my own rear end here, but I would prove it. Show me what you can do. Show mm-hmm. me what you can so, create in a small amount of time that is going to, that in whatever fashion you choose, that's going to tell me that you're the right person for this. And if you don't want to, you're not driven enough for me anyway. The person who doesn't need the job, if they don't want the job, they won't do it. If they want the job, but they don't need it, they'll still do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm also coming from like, after like hiring and training salespeople, like the dude, like, I don't know, man, I'm sorry. I, I, I get where you're coming from, but I don't know. Maybe I'm a little tilted because sales industry, right. Cause you can feel that desperation. There's a churn. They suck. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, well, yo, so if you're not, suck. what, what sucks is like, in, especially in sales, in sales, in customer service, in restaurants, in basic boring labor, you have what we call the hiring churn. They come, they go, they come, they go. No one's ever taught these people how to manage their money. Um, how to uh, create, um, safety in finances, in, housing and living situations they're come from is painful. I mean, I have, I have a client who trains in teaches coaches and trains in a very specific niche of the sales industry. And some of his, some of his clients are 18, 19, 20 years old. And they're going one month, they're making a couple thousand dollars. The next month they're making a hundred thousand dollars. And they're blowing through it before they get it, some of them. Like one of the first things that we clean up when his clients come on is how you deal with your money and how you deal with your life. Life skills are lacking everywhere. And it's, pro- it's evident and prolific in the sales industry. It's evident and prolific in the restaurant and bartending industry, the entertainment industry, in any sort of food service. And your basic labor, um, contractors, that kind of stuff. Like you see it, it's up and down and up and down because you can go do a project and make a fuck ton of money and then not do anything and be dead broke and can't pay your bills. So living in scarcity is, is from being put on, on a hamster wheel and not being taught how to pace yourself. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is a great, set, great opportunity uh, to switch to another segment. But beforehand, in the audience right now, we're interested to kind of hear your take on this in terms of like, um, mm-hmm. you know, you know, what's your take on, you know, hiring a desperate person versus someone who doesn't need a job. We're very interested to hear what your comments are. So put, put that in the comment section, send it to us, let us know. We'll, we'll love to kind of, you know, hear what the market's saying as well. Um, oh, but yeah. yeah so, so yeah, so, so uh, we're going to move into a, uh, another segment and I think it's pretty cool in terms of like um, some, some free value, some free game in terms of what maybe a possibly like our mental modeling around like, okay, when do you outsource versus when do you just bring someone on internally? So like, Ooh. you know, so, so what's, what, what's, I want to unpack. So what's your thought process of like, when it, when this when you know this need needs to be just outsourced to a contractor for a project base, or when does it need to be brought in internally? I'm pretty interested to kind of hear what um, you got to say. Two things: a lot of it has to do with business model. A lot of it has to do with your business model, like what kind of business model you're running, where are you going, and what are you trying to create. So I'm going to give you the two scenarios. You've got John and Jane 
Um, they both started from scratch. They're solopreneurs and they both are going, they went from like one client to 10 clients and they're busy. Now there's two questions you have to ask somebody. A, do you want, how big do you want to get? Like I have clients that I have people that have come to me. They're like, I want you to help me build business. I want it to be sustainable. I want it to be scalable. And their version of sustainable and scalable, their success model is wildly different than mine. Like to the tune of like a a lot of wildly different. I had a woman come to me and she was like, I want to make $75,000 a year. And I want this to be really easy. I want to make, I want to work about four hours a day, three days a week. Great. That's it. That's where she wanted to stop. And it didn't change. It absolutely didn't. That was her perfect world scenario. So if you're not wanting to grow massively or get into... And does your business model support a corporate structure or uh, like an independent team structure? Does your revenue model support it? So then once you shake all those things out, like say it supports either or, okay? For all intents and purposes, we'll say like, Your business model and your revenue model could take either an internal team member or an external one. We'll use like general admin. It's a really good one. Okay. Easy. Most people can support the idea of a full-time admin relatively soon. Right? Right. So if you're looking at like, do I outsource or do I hire in? I outsource my um, executive administrative assistant the first two years, and I went through four of them. I hired on salaried my assistant and she's been with me for six years. Yeah. I went the first three years without an assistant. Technically the first five. But that's also because, you know, I like like things done a certain way. I'm not the easiest know, you're very person to work for. <laughs> I'm not you just like crush people's for. dreams daily, right? Like trying no. to crush. I'm, I'm I'm fucking around. Yep. I, I I think it's interesting because I think most people, including myself, even you, right? You just admitted it. Everyone defaults to like the independent contractor, right? As their mm-hmm. first probably first hire, right? Like everyone does project, you know, hey, copywriter or marketing. Um, I think you hit it on the nail on the head, the business model, right? Like the revenue, probably. I think there's a huge mental shift in terms of like money, a money conversation of like, wow, like if you don't have consistent money coming in, like or predictable income or have shown a history of predictable income, it's probably hard to like, you know, allow Sona's livelihood to be, you know, dependent on your, on you bringing, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that has a lot to do with, I think it's a, a money conversation. Like, oh, I can get mm-hmm. this for this price relative to like, oh, if I bring this person on, I'm going to do benefits. I might have to do this, I might have to do that. And the revenue might not add up unless you're self-funding yourself, right? Which is a whole nother conversation of, have you proven that you're providing value to the marketplace, right? Right. Um, We're operating off of the fact that all those things are true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You provide value. Even, um, even if I were to tell you that predictable revenue, predictable income was there, the, the the outcome doesn't change. People still do that default. Yeah. I think 80% of the entrepreneurs I know are mm-hmm. still using contractors projecting. And so, what's crazy about this, Heather, I did the numbers. Mm-hmm. You actually save way more money and you create way more momentum when you at least bring in a core team, like a core, like, I'm you know, aware. like, said, like an EA or like, a salesperson or an ops, like a project manager, like a core person, like things <laughs> usually like execution, yeah. administration, and sales. Core yeah. people, operations, yeah. execution, administration, sales. And your operations person is not your admin. Do not get it fucking twisted. Don't try it. I did it. Don't try it. Don't try it. <laughs> I did that. Very bad. Almost destroyed possibly the most important relationship in my existence strange enough because my operations director was my mother and i 
tried desperately to get her to also be my admin. And that did not work out. Wow. Talk about relationship dynamics. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) Business relationship dynamics 101. Be careful what you wish for. Now you have to remember almost all of my family at one point or another has worked inside of one of my companies. My mom owns half of one of my companies. That was her retirement present when she turned 50. Yeah, you inspire me to like hire 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 my fam. I've like kind of mm. like tease it out with my mom a little bit because she's like I think she could like yeah, but you know we, we, it's like no rush. You know what I mean? Um, but um, I think this is this is definitely a good take. Um, mm. So I would love to shift because I definitely want us to talk about rocket fuel in another episode, like you know visionary versus mm-hmm. operators. I think we left this open in it, so like stay tuned for another episode where where we'll talk about you know, um, visionary and operator dynamics and timing. And we'll unpack a book. We'll, we'll start maybe a book club once a week, something like that, where we'll talk about books and, uh, um, yes. and have a little fun. Um, so yeah, drop your favorite book. Why not write for future episodes? Drop a, drop your favorite book in the comments. Let us know. Um, so I want to I wanna end the last topic before we go into the free game section. And, you know, this is going to be a five-minute topic. We always got to talk about some crypto, at least five minutes an episode. Mm-hmm. And um, I think something that's super interesting that, like, uh, that that energetically, right? Like I feel it's like the heartbeat of the crypto industry, which is my, the acronym W A G M I. And I would love to un- like uh, you know unpack this a little bit, and I would love to kind of get your take on this, Heather, from the energy okay, well, dynamics. First and foremost, unpack your understanding of it. Yeah. So W A G M I stands for we all gonna we're all going to make it right. Like we're all going to make it right. Mm-hmm. Like we're all going to make it. And from an energy perspective, like it's almost like hype and aligning everyone to a goal. Right. And I think from a psychological perspective, it's like, you know, your FUD is like, you know, bad news or people, you know, fear mongering. The news is very, you know, the, that's what they do all day. If you turn on the news, it's an emergency, a crisis happening every day in the world, right? For the rest of the time, yep. right? And so the, the you know, we all going to make it energy. It's like, hey, staying focused on what the goal is. And I think that's super important because in organizations in general, if you own a business, like you have to align the team to like, we are going to make it, right? It doesn't matter what's going on. Like we control our own destiny by execution. And I think it's a big shift from I am going to make it to we are going to make it right in terms of decentralization versus centralization, right? Yes. I participate in the stock market, Heather participates in the stock market. You guys probably participate in the stock market. Like we are investing in a company that is, you know, their goal is like, I am going to make it or in a way they say we're going to make it, but it's, it's a totally different energy than in the crypto industry because everyone is like rallying and supporting each other. And it's not about the company, but about the community, right? It's about the project. It's about providing value. It's about like driving innovation. And I think that energy is what's fueling. It's literally the heartbeat of all these projects is the, we are going to make it energy. So I'm, I'm super interested to kind of hear your take on it and, you know, your experience and in, in, in with that terminology and, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. So like, first and foremost, like, let me just say that the, that like we we call it shaping energy it's um it's a cohesiveness it's similar to the way you see let me find a really good family friendly reference for people to like land on um girl scout troops boy scout troops like the bonds you create when you do team sports when you're young like it has a lot to do with the same way that those mental and psychological bonds are created right now the stock market and publicly traded companies, the concept in the beginning was the same. If everybody invests, we all get to make it together. Yet, how did it turn out? And I'm not saying anything against the stock market. Trust me when I tell you, like, I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan. And I am a huge fan of being, I run a 100% for profit company. My philanthropic efforts and my um, nonprofit work is a choice. 
I, I run a, for, a quad bottom line for-profit company, period. It is about the bottom line. It is about the money. And yet, that energy that we're all in this together has a lot to do with how community and cohesiveness and bond is created. Cryptocurrency is doing... And I've seen other you know, emerging industries do this and have it work. And I've seen them do this and have it fail. It'll either stay in this energy or it'll shift to the same energy that publicly and privately traded companies have now. It just is what it is. But when something is new and everybody's working together to make it work, then we are all invested in a vision. It comes down to being invested in a com- like committed and invested to the same outcome, the same vision, the same resource the same why like decentral the decentralization of of currency as a whole was uh, oh what movie matthew mcconaughey um he was in it it's where he got that line all right all right all right what was his first movie Oh, man, you're talking about like it's like from the, uh, oh it's on the tip of my tongue oh my goodness <laughs> It's from all the stores. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh my gosh, I'm about to look it up. I mean, or no, from the 60s. I, neither, neither left nor right. Like the idea, like, the idea of it, it's, it's like the, the decentralization of currency is the like, fuck the man. You don't get to tell us what we can do with our money, when we can do it, where we can do it. Like, it's also how the dark web started. Look how that went. I mean, <laughs> there are two sides to every coin. But the truth is, is that when everybody is collaboratively working towards something, and the outcome, the final outcome benefits everybody equally. You get that. We're all going, we are all going to make it energy. If everybody is equally heard and everybody's equally benefiting, and it's it's everybody wanting the same end result. Now, crypto and blockchain and DeFi and NFT, like the whole everything that has to do and like that's been happening in the decentralized world is very much that. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's emerging technology. It is being written as it's being played. (laughs) And uh, I want to definitely take this one step further in terms of like the psychology of it, of people projecting certainty, right? Like, because the most certain person always wins, right? I always train with that in sales. Like, you know, the client (laughs) is certain, if the client is certain that you can't help them more than you're certain that you can help them, then <laughs> you're not going to get the sale. They'll never work with you. Yeah. They'll yeah. never work with you. Right. And I think the same thing in terms of like, you know, dealing with, you know, pushing innovation, I think in terms of like certainty within an organization, like you just mentioned it, like people want to feel heard, right? Like people, if your employees mm-hmm. feel certain that you have their back, that you have their best interest at heart, that you'll be there, that you'll mm-hmm. give them the resources, it will stir up, magic right and so i think certainty plays a huge role in society because obviously it's most certain person will win and right now crypto and blockchain is certain as af like i've never been around such projection of certain energy in my entire life like mm-hmm. what's going on in these projects and like some of them are fud right like just complete bull crap there's scams out there of course there's always going to be bad actors in all industries always right i mean people talk about money well, like yeah. money drugs and all types of stuff like this stuff is always going to be around right it's, it's never going to stop right um it, it can't not be there you have with without dark honey there's never light yeah how would contrast. you even know what the light looks like if there was no dark mm-hmm. so huge big huge fan of the, of the projection so um i love that segment i love our little five minute crypto segment that was sick mm-hmm. um and we're going to end on this note with some free game i feel like we've been given a lot of free game through this whole episode but you know why not, oh, not yeah. over deliver um you want to start it off or you want me to start it off oh go for it all right so and I if think you've got free- something that you want me to finally divulge i'm you're you're welcome to make requests yeah um <laughs> i think i think it's great to diversify right because you never know who's listening and um so i think i'm gonna talk about something that's on topic today just to end it off and that is some advice that I got that is super important that really helps me in my, my decisions since we're the topic today has really been about teams and, and hiring and things like that. 
hire slow, fire fast, right? Like if you make a mistake, oh, a don't sit on it. Like sitting on it, like is will drain the energy. Like it could literally probably like be a, a like a poison in your business. So like, don't be so quick to hire, but be very quick to fire. Like today, for instance, my case, hire someone last night, gave them a first assignment. Obviously they were, they lied about their competency in terms of doing the task and the, you know, the communication wasn't there and it just wasn't a good fit. So cut it while like right then and there, like don't get, emo- you know, don't allow someone to get emotional. I think it's a being integrity as well. Like if you know someone's not a good fit, like do them the best honor by giving them opportunity to find a better fit for them. And also I'll possibly learn a lesson. You know, I think that's also important. So that's, that's my, my free game of the day. Um, you can keep it on topic if you want, Heather, or you can go to left field. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it on topic. Um, let's talk about team. Like, let's, let's keep this free game on team. Like be really clear for, for those of you out there, especially those of you who are somewhere between, I've got an idea all the way up to, I would say about 750,000, three quarters of a million to a million. Once you hit a million, if you're if you're not doing this yet, I'm curious as to either what you're charging or how you're making money, <laughs> because it might be quite slightly impossible. Be really clear on what kind of, what what kind of business model are you building. Like, I will give you a really boldly honest example. I have built multiple six and seven figure companies. I have sold seven figure companies that have gone to be nine figure companies. And the truth is, is that it took me damn near killing myself over it to realize being a CEO was not what I wanted to do. I did not want to run a large team. Now I've got 11, I've got a team of 11 under me now. They're awesome. We run five companies with 11 people. That's a lot of companies for that, for not a lot of humans. And most of them, most of that, I am not involved in the day-to-day choices and the solutions and the decision-making. And I've grown a team that runs themselves to take some of the best ideas and innovation and technology in in the space that I'm super competent in to, to the next level. But you have to be super clear. Be clear on what you're trying to create. If you want to build something where you get to make all the choices, then great. Be ready to become a CEO because being a CEO is not being an innovator. Being a CEO is being an, a decision maker and a, the judge, the jury, the keeping the peace. You're you're the nice guy in the middle and you're the one that smooths it all out. Shit rolls uphill and work rolls downhill. <laughs> That is just how it is when it's all said and done. You want to build a corporate style company, all of the shit rolls right onto your plate and all the work rolls right onto theirs. So you have to, you have to know where you want to be. You really do. Because I, it took me almost, almost destroying one of my companies, which is the one that is the most near and dear to my heart to realize that being the boss was the worst choice I could have made. The worst choice. Growing a big and like an expanding an agency was the worst choice I could make. I needed to expand my headspace, change my offer. We needed to shift our market. I did not need to expand my team and just get bigger. So you have to know where you really want to be. Where do you want to end up? And if your goal is to do that, then do that. And when you're when it's not your zone of genius. Hire the right person for it, no matter what it costs you. Don't hire somebody, hire the right person. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Love it. All right. You amazing capitalist out there. Um, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to hit that ratings button, share, comment. You know, reach out to us if you ever want to be on the show. If you're an entrepreneur out there who wants to play with us in our playground of possibility and also free game, because we're all about giving value to our community. Um, but yeah, we thank you for joining us and we're out. See you next time. Bye, guys.